。皆さんこんにちは。津田塾大学の国際教学担当の副学長をしております早川敦子と申します。あの今日はあの対面での講演会ということですが、あの津田塾大学の創立120周年記念の特別のあの講演会ということで。国際化推進ということで、素晴らしいお客様をお招きすることができました。あのこの講演会は皆様ご存知のように、あの英語と日本語と両方で行われるということなんですけれども、あの今日の、えー、ゲストロジャーパルバース先生は2カ国語だけでなくて7カ国語ができるというあの大変な語学の天才でいらっしゃるんですが、Surviving the Future: Being a Japanese in the 21st Century というタイトルで。お話しくださいますあのロジャー・パルバースさんはアメリカ合衆国出身のオーストラリア在住の作家すで、えー、にあのいくつもの著作がございますがあの作家翻訳家劇作家演出家そしてあのいくつかの映画もあの撮影しておられましてあの東京工業大学の名誉教授でもおられました。あの日本はもう第二の故郷というか第一の故郷というぐらいであの自分のふるさとだというふうにあのおっしゃっていらっしゃいますが、えー、その中でも花巻があの彼の,あの故郷だそうで、えー、宮沢賢治の翻訳英訳でもあの大変有名なお仕事を残しておられます。あのカリフォルニア大学のロサンゼルス校を卒業の後ハーバード大学の大学院で学ばれて日本には1967年にいらっしゃいましたあの最初は京都の方にお暮らしになって、まあ、ロシア語やポーランド語の講師をお務めになるなどあの数々のお仕事を経られた後その後1972年にキャンベラのオーストラリア国立大学に赴任して今度は日本語日本文学を教えられました、えー、皆さんもご存知でしょうかあの若い学生の方はご存知ないかもしれないんですけれども、えー、1980年の映画の「戦場のメリークリスマス」あの坂本龍一の,あの素晴らしい曲で有名なあの映画の,あの監督である大島渚監督の助監督をあの務められまして。再び来日されて演劇活動を行って井上久志さんなんかともねあの随分一緒にご仕事をされたと伺っています。2007年制作の映画の「明日への遺言」において、えー、脚本も執筆されておられますし2008年は先ほど申し上げたように宮沢賢治賞を受賞されておられます。えー、雨にも負けずの翻訳で、第19回ノア文芸翻訳賞も受賞されておられその後井上康賞も受賞されるということで、まあ、大変なあの日本通でおられて私が使えないような日本語の表現も巧みにお使いになられるわけですけれどもあの津田塾大学とのご縁も深くてあの今まで何度もご講演をいただいておりますけれども特に2013年に「スターサンド」あの星砂物語で歌う大変美しい映画あの沖縄戦などをあの題材にしたちょっと悲しい映画でもあるんですけれどもあのそれで諸監督を務められたんですけれどもその中のシーンをの一部をあの津田塾大学でロケをしてくださってあの学生だけでなく教員もエクストラの通行人をしたりしてあの映画に参加させていただきました。あの著作は大変たくさんんあるんですけれどもあの驚くべき日本語これはあの私もあの翻訳に関わらせていた,だいたんですけれども、まあ、日本語という言語があの私たちは日本人が考えている以上に国際的な言語になるような要素をたくさん持っているというあの本当に優れた著作であのよく高校の,あの大学入試のための模擬試験にもよく使われるというあの本なんですけれども。あのこういうご長所のほかにご自身の日本でのいろんな出会いやエピソードをつづられた「もし日本という国がなかったら」などがございます。えー、2018年には旭日中受賞を受賞され2019年にはオーストラリア勲章も受賞されるという大変インターナショナルなあの活躍を続けておられますのであの今日のタイトルにございます「まあ、サバイビング・ザ・フューチャー」というそういうあのテーマでお話しいただくには本当に素晴らしいお話を伺えるのだととても楽しみにしております。先生どうぞよろししくお願いいたしますありがとうございました、はい、どうもどうもありがとうございました。
皆さんこんにちは。早川先生、どうもありがとうございました。Now, today I've been asked to speak in English, so I will do that, but I will be using some Japanese from time to time. Now,、uh, Hayakawa Sensei told you about some of my background. I arrived in Japan in September 1967, and at that time, I didn't speak one word of Japanese, and I didn't know any Japanese people at all.、Uh, so, the first day I came here, I had to eat dinner, of course, so I went to a restaurant, and it happened to be an Odeng restaurant. So, the first word That I learned in Japanese was chikua. Probably the first student of Japanese, too. And the second word I learned in Japanese was gammodoki. So every night I ate odeng because that's the only words I knew、uh, at that time.、Um, I learned Japanese fairly quickly. I stayed in Kyoto. I got married. My wife and I had four children. We sent Our children, even though my wife is British, we sent our children to Japanese schools. I participated in PTA. You know what the PTA is? Pachinko, Tobacco, Alkoru. That's my PTA.、Uh, but,、uh, and became a part of Japanese life. But as I was learning Japanese, I realized that every language is different. And speaking a language, you know, there are 6,500 languages. Used in the world, about that many, maybe 7,000 languages. So, a lot of languages. And all of them are different in terms of the kind of structure that they ha have, the logic, the body language, and most important, the culture behind the language. You cannot learn a foreign language unless you know deeply the culture that underpins the language that you're trying to learn. So, for instance, to give you an example, something very simple, people often ask me what university I went to. Like, Daigaku wa dochina dattan desu ka? And I said, Habado. And they're, ha, ha. People had this reaction, which I didn't understand, you know, because Habado is like supposed to be so famous in Japan. So, over a little bit of time, I started to answer the question like a Japanese. Because to speak like Japanese, you have to, that you know the language. So people say, Daigaku wa dochi da tan desu ka? And I say, Ano, ma, so desu ne, hai, eto, do you tell it kana? To ma, hai, ma, ichi o, eto, habado da tan desu ka? And then everybody would say, Ah, so desu ka? So I realized you have to speak that. Or people would ask a question like, Naze ni hon ga suki desu ka? Ma, nan to naku. Ha, so desu ka? Because you said that in English, because, well, maybe people would say, Anta daijobu desu ka? Are you all right? You know, so. Or, where's your wife? Kanai wa, ah, Okusama, dochira desu ka? Ah, ma, kanai wa chotto. My wife is a little. Ten, 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 ten. So every language has its logic, and English has the same thing. So many people think Japanese is, a, is a, an ambiguous language, aimai na gengo. And if you look at the book that、uh, Hayakawa Sensei translated so beautifully, you will realize that I don't believe Japanese is an ambiguous language. In fact, there's no such thing as an ambiguous language. Maybe the way people speak seems ambiguous to people from other countries. If you come from another country and, people, and you don't understand Japanese or understand it only a little bit, you might think that Japanese people are being ambiguous. But today I want to start, I'm going to talk about your role, your personal role in the 21st century. That's the goal of my speech today. But I want to start by talking one, saying one more thing about language. I want to ask you a question, and I want you to think about the answer. Very simple question Is Japanese a beautiful language? Nihongo wa utsukushi gengo desu ka? Is Japanese a beautiful language? 
Now, there's no correct answer to this. There's no answer to this. It's your opinion. Could I just ask you, please, to raise your hand if you think Japanese is a beautiful language? Okay, what about how many think Japanese is not a beautiful language? Not a beautiful, that's interesting, thank you. How many think it's neither beautiful or not beautiful? So no one, oh, one in back, thank you very much. That's very interesting. Uh, I have at home the Kenkyusha Yeiji Ten. It's about 1,240 pages long. And more than four, 400 pages of that dictionary, which is in alphabetical order from A to Z, of course, you know, A, Akari, Aimai, Nantoka, Nantoka, B, Bijin Toka, Bimyo Toka, Kaita. That's the way it's written. In the one third, about one third of the entire dic of the words in the dictionary begin with a particular letter in the English alphabet. What is that letter? Is it A? Is it? N, is it T, T, like Tachi, Tsuteto, or does anybody, what do you think? It's K, K, Kakiku Keko. I would venture to say that almost the, the majority of people here, Hayakawa, not Suga, but Hayakawa, have a K in their name. Is K a beautiful sound? K, 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 K. For instance, Kabe no Kagi ni Kakateru Kanazuchi wa Yuka ni Okochata. Is that Tadashi Nyongo Deska Sensei? Tadashi Zan, Yokata, Hanshi Shinashita. Utsukushi Deska Sorewa. Is it beautiful? Would you consider that it's not very beautiful? K, K. What about a sound that I speak Russian, and Russian has the sound ch. Arabic has ch. Uh, Polish has ch. You, I would venture to say that you don't think that ch is a beautiful sound. But in Polish, kochamcze is I love you. Sounds very beautiful, but it's got a ch in it. So if everybody talks like that, you think, so there are skuśku naigengo. So, if there is a correct, ah, with K, what about kakikueba kane ga naru nari hōryōji? Kirei janai desu ka? Ne? Furui ke kawazu tobiko mizu no ato. Ah, kirei. K, lots of Ks in that. So, it's all very relative. So, I would say, inside your own language, if you only speak your own language, it is impossible for you to know if, this, if your language is beautiful or not. Many Japanese have told me they don't like the sound of Korean. Many English speakers say German sounds very harsh to them, you know, with a long sound, except that English is a Germanic language, in fact. Many people say, but French is beautiful. But this is meaningless. There is no single criterion for judging the sounds of a language, whether a language is beautiful or not. If it strikes you as beautiful, that's very nice. If it doesn't, that's also OK. Objectively, no language is any more beautiful than any other language. Now, the reason why I brought this up is it's a kind of metaphor. Because we are living in a world now, especially in the last 20 or 30 years, where there's 
nothing in the center. The Japanese people, since Meiji, even before Meiji, the Japanese people, a thousand years ago or 1,500 years ago, had something in the center, and that was to, uh, Tang China, Chugoku, or Kankoku, the culture where uh, everything from architecture to the writing system, philosophy, literature, religion, all came from the Asian continent to Japan. So the Japanese people always here on the side would look to the center and see these things. Uh, after Meiji, this center was Europe, what's called in Japanese Obe, the West, Western civilization, Bumei Kaika, and so on. Uh, and Japan compared itself with the West and was able to develop and set its own sense of morality for society on the basis of what Japanese people saw in Germany. Mori Ogai went to Germany, Nagai Kafu went to France, Natsume Sozeki went to London, and they came back, with, as many other people did, and they brought their notion, their Japanese notion of civilization. After World War II, it was replaced by America and American culture. And so it was very easy for Japanese people to know what J Japanese society was like because it was a kind of comparison. People wouldn't say to me, uh, Nihon no bunka wa unique desu ne, or Nihon wa unique na gengo desu. I'd say, why do you say that? It's a unique language. Datte America, eigo ni wa kou yukotu iwanai janai desu ka? What about rokusen goihaku no gengo? What about the other 6,499 languages? How do you know people don't speak, that say things like that in those languages? But as long as you compared everything with America, you were on safe ground, and you could, your feet were on the ground as far as Japanese society was concerned. But in the last 30 years, several things have happened. And I won't go into this too much, it'll take too long. But in 1995, in January 1995, the Hanshin Dai Shinsai occurred. 6,500 people died. Uh, in March of the same year, a very evil terrorist group, religious group, called Om Shinri Kyo, uh, let out sarin gas, a nerve gas, on the Tokyo subways. I remember that very, very well. And a few years before then, uh, the bubble burst. This is a metaphor for the Japanese economy going down. But it's not only the Japanese economy that went down, it's the Japanese society, Japanese values. Japanese people lost their way, I think. And we now talk about 30 years of stagnation and of being nice little English phrase, at sea. At sea means bozen jishitsu. Toshite nasu toko mo shiranai shinkyo ni ojiteru. Not knowing, being disoriented, not knowing where the land is. This is the Japan that you live in now. Not the Japan of Meiji, not the Japan of Taisho or Showa. I came here in the Showa period. Uh, I arrived in Showa 42, but you live in a Japan where you cannot look to something to compare yourself with. And this has become a problem for Japanese, how to find your feet on the ground and your own values and your own worldview so that you can lead a productive and exciting and creative life. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. So we're dealing with nothing in the middle because America, I don't know if you follow the news, but I believe that the United States, where I spent the first 21 years of my life, is on the verge of a civil war. I think by far the most dangerous country in the world 
is not Russia or China. It's the United States of America. And uh, I fear that if Japanese people continue to look to the United States for guidance or as a kind of criterion for what is democratic, what is moral, and what is proper, they are making a very big mistake because it's not there anymore. Now, I hope, I really hope that America will not have a civil war and that they will get their house in order, so to speak. But it is not a good thing to look at America for guidance. So we're living in a world where all the countries uh, of the world, even China, that's a futsu, whatever, wherever you are, there's no center anymore for those countries to look toward. They all have the same problem that you do. All the young French people, all the young German people, they have the problem to find their own way. So you're not alone. So I wrote down here on this piece of paper for you today this word, and I, I, you can see it, multipolarity, takyokuse, multipolarity. The kyoku is very good. This is exactly, exactly the translation, chokuyaku, of multipolarity. Pole, P-O-L-E, is kyoku. It's a pole, like nankyoku, the South, South Pole, Hokkyoku, the North Pole, and ta means a lot of, and say just makes it a noun, I-T-Y. So you're living in a world where you have to understand lots of different poles, lots of different standards for you to know where you stand in the world. It was easy for your parents because they looked here. And it was easy for people in Meiji because they had Germany and France and Britain and Italy. And they wanted, Japanese wanted to build an empire. And they looked at those countries. They all had very powerful empires. And they said, OK, what do we need to have an empire? We need literature. We need theater. We need ships, airplanes, communications, transport. And so the Japanese built all those things with Europe as the model. The shosetsu, the novel, came from Europe. Easy for the people of Meiji. Not easy for you. What are you going to do in this world where there's, there's nothing for you to aim toward? So you think, well, maybe, maybe my teachers will tell me what I should do. Wonderful teachers at this school. Or maybe this speaker who's here, who's had a lot of experience, he's going to say, this is what you should do. And then when you walk out of here, you'll say, ah, wakatta. I'm, I'm enlightened. I'm going to do that. No way will any leader, teacher, priest, or anybody tell you what to do with your life because they don't know the answer. You know what a teacher does, a good teacher? When you're little, a teacher says, point at, up at that thing. And you point up. And the teacher says, that's called the moon. So a teacher can tell you where to point to see the moon. But the distance between your finger tip and the moon has to be traveled by you alone. No one can tell you how to get from your hand to the moon. The moon being a metaphor for your goal in life, or what you want to achieve, or whatever you want, in, you know, whatever you desire. No one can tell that. You have to decide that by yourself. So as a young person studying, you have to say, well, how can I decide? What do I need to decide? And there are many answers to that. Learn foreign languages is one way, because then you'll understand different points of view. When I learned Russian, I started to teach myself Russian 
when I was 13 years old. I was living in Los Angeles. Think of it. It was 1957. It was Los Angeles in the United States. There was, they sang, the Cold War. Russians were Kyosan Shugi. I was teaching myself Russian as a 13-year-old boy. And my father's friends, this is your son, Red. You know, no, I don't think so, Dad said. I wasn't. I was just trying to learn Russian. I was always looking out. If I had listened to my teachers, I wouldn't have studied Russian because, or Japanese or anything like that at that time. So the world is trying to make you into something. The world wants you to be what they need, what they think they need, not what you want. And since you don't know what you want, mostly young people don't know, see, it's really strange. Parents and teachers say to you, do what you want. But that's not good advice because you, you don't know what you like. You don't know what you want to do. You may like something on Monday, but want to do something else on Tuesday. And that's natural. I didn't know that I was going to be a writer until I was in my late 20s. I didn't know. If you asked me at your age, nani naritai was a stupid question. I hate that question. You know, because they just see the, the parents and they decide on the basis of that. So um, I brought here a quote. I have a number of quotes I want to read to you. This is a quote from the 19th century by an American philosopher called Ralph Waldo Emerson. Emerson was very popular in Meiji, Japan. He wrote a book called Self-Reliance, Jiko Shindai, Self-Reliance. Everybody in Meiji read Emerson. Miyazawa Kenji read Emerson. Natsume Soseki read Emerson. Koizumi Miyakumo read Emerson. Everybody read Emerson. And Emerson said this, and I'll read it in English, and then I've translated it for you into Japanese. It's a little bit complicated, maybe. To be yourself in a world that is constantly trying to make you something else is the greatest achievement. Taizu anata wo nanimono ka ni kaiyoto suru sekai no naka de jibun rashiku ari tsuzukeru koto to be yourself when your parents and your teachers and your politicians say, you should do this, you should do that. And they use big words, grobaru, be grobaru. I hate the word grobaru. I'm always asked, I'm often asked to give speeches, they part of us and say, Global is meaningless. How can you tell a young person to be global? Identity is a not identity more daikira. That's what I think of identity. I never use the word identity or try not to. What's your identity? I'm me, that's a, that's enough. I don't need identity. So don't listen to those things. What you need and what everybody has inside them is described by these two words. This is a normal average English phrase that everybody knows, moral compass. If you translated this directly, chokuyaku sureba, doutoku teki dashinban, moral compass. But what it means, a moral compass means, is that all of you have in your heart, in your mind, in your body, a moral compass, your own compass. And that compass has a needle, a hadi. And that compass needle says to you, says to you, you should go in that direction from now on. 
this is your own moral compass, not me. And your moral compass says, you should go, I should go in that direction. And you should follow your moral compass. Go where it tells you, not where somebody else tells you you sh should go. Now, you know, Yasashi, it's easy, easier said than done. I, I must admit that. And I'm going to, in the next half hour, I want to tell you how I think you can understand your own moral compass. When I arrived in Japan, uh, I couldn't read Japanese, but I asked a friend who was a professor at a university called Kogei Seni Daigaku in Kyoto, in Matsugasaki in Kyoto. He was Abe Sensei, Abe Tetsuzo Sensei. I said, Abe Sensei, who writes the most beautiful Japanese? Bunsho. And he said, Surya Miyazawa Kenji. That's Miyazawa Kenji. That was the best advice I ever had. So I decided to read Miyazawa Kenji. And I went to Marzen, which was on Kawara Machidori, just Sanjo Sagata Tokoro, Ima Nai Disketo. Used to be a Marzen there. And I bought a little book, Bungo Bong, of Miyazawa Kenji. This was, I was in Japan about two months. Mukara status, from zero, no Japanese. So I took out the shortest book story. It's Zashiki Bokko no Hanashi. Maybe some of you know it. And I started to read it. And one thing which is really good, good advice when you learn a foreign language, don't use a dictionary. You don't need a dictionary. Just read the language. You don't learn a language through your eyes or your mind. You absorb it through the pores of your skin. So I was reading Miyazawa Kenji with my skin. And you want to know something? I understood. I thought I understood it. Maybe I didn't. But I thought I understood. And I fell in love with the works of Miyazawa Kenji. And the next summer, in 1968, I went to Hanamaki. And I went to the, uh, was a, this was before they had a Tohoku Shinkansen. It took nine hours from Kyoto to Hanamaki. And I went to this little kiosk in the front of the station, which was a kind of tourist information place. And I said, Miyazawa Kenji no seika wa dochira desu ka? Where is Miyazawa Kenji's? A home where he was born. And she took out a map and says, Toyozawa John, Dokukuchi Karite. It took about, takes about 30 minutes. So I walked there. And when I got there, there was a nameplate, a hyosatsu, on the gate of the house. It said, Miyazawa. And I thought, are they? Mada ikitoru ka na? So I thought, oh my God, I thought he was dead. So I went in. And I stood, I opened the door, because in those days, Japanese people left the sliding doors open, all of them open. You never uh, rang a bell or anything. You opened the door, you stepped into the genkan, and said, Gomen kudasai, like that. And Miyazawa Kenji's brother, Seiroku, came out. And he said, hi. And I said, uh, and he went, because oh, no one had studied Miyazawa Kenji in the West. It, if you remember, or if you, you know, you've learned back in the 60s, uh, that, later that year, 1968, Kawabata Yasunari received the Nobel Prize for Literature. Mishima Yukio was still alive. In fact, in November 1970, I was watching television, the news at 12 o'clock. And I saw him in Ichigaya, and he went in and Kaishaku killed himself, or had somebody kill him. And Tanizaki had been uh, 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 passed away about two years before then, three years before then. So if you asked anybody about contemporary Japanese literature, all of the American professors would say, Nishima Tanizaki Kaobata, of course, I never studied Japanese, so I had my own moral compass about Japanese literature. Miyazawa Kenji was considered hekichi, you know, remote, fan, doa, sakka, 
children's writer, Fantaji Sakka. Now, I never once believed that Miyazawa Kenji was a Doa Sakka or a Fantaji Sakka. I coined the term in one of my books, Kenji Realism. Kenji's books, stories, are very real. Just as Van Gogh, the Dutch painter, when he paints a chrysanthemum or a sunflower, or he paints a starry night, that's not a fantasy. That's what he sees. He is painting what he sees. Don't expect art to be like the thing you see. It's much deeper. Art is always artificial. The word art comes from the same word as artificial, jinko teki. Art is never natural. There's only art that looks natural and art that doesn't. So Seido san took me around, and then I fell in love with the works of Miyazawa Kenji, and then I translated him, and so on. And I'm still studying Miyazawa Kenji after 55 years. Now, Kenji, how does Kenji differ from Western writers and from other Japanese writers? He differs very, very much. And he, one little word, which will give you a clue, is the very simple word, ima, now. Now, anybody who studies quantum physics, Ryoshi Rikigaku, as I am very interested in quantum physics, one of my hobbies, has a very difficult time. concept of what is now. As we know, now is the past immediately. Almost all writers around the world describe an instant in time, like Kakikueba Kaneya Naru Naru or Furuike Yakawa's Tobikomi. That's you go, ah, sugoi. Yoku, what? I can really see that. Only Kenji does not describe things because, according to Kenji, whatever is now takes in, in encompasses everything that happened before now and everything that will happen after now, all within the concept of now. In other words, when he describes a mountain, he must tell you what that mountain was like 80,000 years ago and 800,000 years ago, and what it's going to be like 80,000 years from now and 800,000 years from now. If you can see the world and yourself like that and realize that everything that you are that has gone into making you has come from the stars, like Yushi, like Shinchose, supernova, through the cosmos, makes us all. Everything that happened in Japan, in the world, to your parents, your grandparents, that is your now. But not only that, I think a lot of people would say, would understand that. You now include your future already. It's not, it hasn't happened yet. That's true, but it's inside you. So what is knowledge? Chishiki to wa nanzoya. What is knowledge? Knowledge is not information about the past. Knowledge is the ability to predict the future. Chishiki to wa kako nitsuite no jōhō de wa arimasen. Mirai o yōgen suru baitai no ryoku desu. If you have that, and I'll tell you how you can get that, if you have that, then you will be able to look into your moral compass and decide. So in school, in Japanese schools, a teacher will give a test and say, when did the Kamakura period begin and when did it end? And if you go saying, can't remember it myself. You know, and you get it right, you go to Todai. If you get it wrong, you don't go to Todai because you fail the exam. But that's not knowledge. That's ridiculous. You want to know that? Look it up on your phone. Go to Google Sensei. He'll tell you that stuff. You don't need to know that. Don't waste time learning stuff like that. And if your teachers 
give you that test, throw it back in their face. Sorry, <laughs> I used to be a teacher too. So uh, knowledge, how do you get the ability, the ability to understand the past? And you have to have this mentality. I'll tell you one more thing. You do not inherit the past from your ancestors. You borrow the past from your grandchildren. I must borrow the future, sorry, from your grandchildren. That's your now. You are right now borrowing everything, borrowing the future, taking away or giving, or giving something to your grandchildren, your children and your grandchildren. That's what you have to think. And Kenji has a wonderful story, and that story is called Indra's net. Indra no ami. Indra no ami. Indra's net. And you can read it on the Aozora Bunko. It's about two pages long. It'll take you five minutes. Read Indra no. But I have a peculiar interpretation. Boku niyo chutto myo na kaishaku ga arun desu ne. Kono Indra no ami. Chutto Kenji wa nattoku shinai desu. Kenji might not agree with me about, my, about Indra's net. And my view of this, and this is what's going to help you look into at your moral compass. The entire universe is made up of a net. Everything, think of it, a net. Big, huge net, like a fishing net. And all of us are hanging every, on the net, not just us. Every animal, every rock, every drop of water, every piece of dust, every speck of dust, everything in the entire, every star, every galaxy, everything is hanging on this incredibly huge, immense net. This is a metaphor, okay? Because Kenji's world is very unusual. He does not distinguish between organic and inorganic. To Kenji, a rock and a mountain are just as important as a pig and a human being. Very, very unusual view of the world. And in front of, let's say you are hanging on this net. In, fr in front of you is a drop of dew. Tsuyu no itteki ga aru, jibun no mae ni. And this drop of dew is a, is a mirror, kore kagami de aru. It's a kind of ishu no kagami, kind of mirror. And you can look into this rounded mirror, which is a sphere. And in it, you can see behind you all the way back to the beginning of time. And if you just move your head, you can look forward all the way to the end of time, if there is going to be an end of time. You can look up, down, left, right, Thanks to this drop of dew, you can even see on the drop somewhere else, you can see everything at once, everything that has happened everywhere, and everything that's going to happen. If you think of yourself in front of this drop of dew, you will feel, understand that you are just one little part of an entire universe, Shinra Bansho no, Shitotsu no. And what happened in the Western world 2,000 years ago is that three religions were born in the Middle East, that is to say Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. They're all Ishinkyo, monotheistic, and they're all basically the same religion. I consider them just one, one religion. And they all put human beings at the center. Human beings, animals, like cows, sheep, dogs, cats, worms, bees, whatever you want. But the only, the only individual, the only thing that had a conscience, that had a soul, Tamashi, 
they invented this funny thing called a soul, uh, is the human being. Whereas, according to Miyazawa Kenji, everything has a soul. Every animal, every plant. And if you are going to develop, if you are going to create an economy which is rich and prosperous, if you destroy the plants, the animals, the air, the water, the earth, the soil, then the thing that's going to be extinct, it's going to be human beings that will be extinct. Kenji says, you must, this is a, more than a hundred years ago, he was saying, you must not kill animals. He's the first writer in the world to write stories about doubutsu fukushi, animal welfare. His view of energy is sustainable energy, recyclable energy, saise kano energy, like sun and wind. So if you just read Miyazawa Kenji's stories for how he describes the light, the wind, the water, and the soil, you will realize this is a writer of the 21st century. 19th世紀に生まれた21世紀の作家. And this is at a time he's writing in the 1920s when Japan is militaristic, chauvinistic, kokusei shugi, uh, imperialistic, going into China, expanding. Uh, everybody is writing about Nihonjin wa ko, do no ko no, and Nippon wa ko daru beki to. Miyazawa Kenji, I've read the entire, all, everything that he's ever written. He only mentions Nihon or Nihonjin twice in the entire works. He's not concerned with the Japanese. And so naturally, the famous professors of Japanese literature in the United States, in Britain, in other parts of the world, and in Japan, didn't consider Miyazawa Kenji a representative daihyo, nihonbungaku daihyo tekinasaka. They were nice because he doesn't describe us. So for a long time, he was neglected. And then, after the Daishinsai, and after the, the earthquake and tsunami in 2011, he became very famous again, because he had the answers for all of us of how to find our way in life. Now, if you ask a Christian, a devout Christian, what do you want to know the most? What's the most important question to you? That person, if they are a devout Christian, would say, Why was I born? Of course, a lot of people would, might ask that question. And there is an answer. There's a Christian answer to that. And the Christian answer is, to serve Almighty God in heaven by doing good things, serving God. It's a very admirable kind of goal. If you ask me as our Kenji, you say, Ken, Kenji san, nani ga ichiban shiritai ka? He wouldn't say, Why was I born? He would say, Naze watashi wa watashi na no ka? Why am I me? Why am I me? And not you. But Kenji has an answer. I believe he has an answer. If he, if he were here, I would ask him. But since he's not here, I'll answer the question for him. <laughs> the answer is, and you're going to find this very strange. I am not me. I am you. Now you think, that's weird. Kenji-san, I am not me. I am you. Now you think, that's weird. 
感情移入して、エンパタイズ。いやいや、違う。I am you, which means what you feel, I feel. When you hurt yourself and you fall down and you hit your head and you say, Oh my God, my head hurts. Your head hurts too. My head hurts. When you cry, I cry. And when you are happy, I am happy. Miyazawa Kenji really believed that, and his characters live by that. Now, that's a very hard thing to achieve. That's not empathy. Goes way beyond empathy. It's total identification with the other person. So, naturally, when the great earthquake and tsunami hit on the 11th of March 2011 in Tohoku, which is Miyazawa Kenji's home region, everybody turned to Ame Nimo Makezu to understand what to do. They asked themselves, maybe, they said to themselves, maybe this will help me. And Watanabe Ken, the actor, he read this, and millions of people heard it, looked at it at YouTube. So, there are many, many things I want to say to you, but unfortunately, we're almost running out of time. I just want to help you get something for you to do in the 21st century. And for a minute or two, I'm going to give you a sweep of history from the 18th century to the 19th to the 20th century. So, it'll be very general. What happened in the 18th century? The 18th century was the era, the century where Jinkeng, human rights, were first thought of. People started to think of individual psychology. The beginnings of the scientific revolution were in the 18th century. The French Revolution happened at the end of the 18th century. The American Revolution occurred at the end of the 18th century. The 19th century is a century of great scientific achievement, hygiene, eisei, gaku, biology, astronomy, transportation, trains, the telephone, the telegraph, transportation, everything. People moved. Do you know that before the train, the railway, came to Great Britain, 90% of the population of Great Britain never went more than 30 kilometers from their home in their entire life. So life was very different. The train, Tetsudo, so Ginga Tetsudo. Really trained, very important for Miyazawa Kenji for development. The 20th century, the 19th century saw the end of slavery. The 20th century saw the rights of women and children being recognized. Colonies, British,、uh, the European countries lost their colonies. France, Italy, Britain, and Germany lost their colonies. Japan lost its colonies, it lost Korea. And democracy seemed to spread around the world. However, there were two great world wars, and the dropping of the two atom bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki were the two most catastrophic, disastrous events of the 20th century. So we have scientific revolution. But the terrible things that science d o So, これは過去のことだからどうでもいい。It's fine. That's, you should learn about all these things, but that's, you learn about them by reading books. What about the 21st century? What's going to happen? You, as I said earlier, you have to have the ability to predict the future if you want to have a part of, in it yourself. Create an image of the future. Think now what's going to happen. Look over the drop of dew on Indra's net and see into the future, and you will see that everything is going to be redefined. 
what it means to be human, ningen sono mono, ningen darukoto sono mono, AI, robots, maybe, what it means to be a man, a woman, somebody who has uh, a, tr a transgender, what's usually called in Japanese chusei, dansei, josei, chusei. Gender, sex, everything is going to be redefined. Food, what we eat is going to be redefined. The air we breathe, the water we drink, everything is going to change. It really is. You will see a lot of this. And then, of course, in later centuries, it'll even change more. This is what you have to do if you want to be able to see where the needle of your moral compass is, is pointing. Now, I have a lot more things I want to say to you, but I'm running out of time. So what I want to do in the last few minutes of, of the talk, is I want to read to you Ame ni mo makezu in English. I want you to hear it in English. And then I'm going to play a five-minute DVD for you. So if you could get the DVD, who's ever going to start it up. And I'll, it'll be about two minutes from now or so, and I'll tell you when to start it. Thank you. So I have it. I have my translation of, Stro of Amenu Marquesa here on my phone. So just put on my glasses. And I think there are two things I want you to listen for in this poem. One of the things is, and Seiroku-san, uh, Miyazawa Kenji's brother, said to me, the essence of this poem, kono shi no shinzui wa, shin wa, uh, itte, go and do this, go and do that, go and help the mother, go and help the children, go and say this. So itte nani ka suru, he said that's very important. And of course, he's right. But uh, I find something right in the middle of this very, very important. In Japanese, it's arayuru koto wo yoku mikiki shi wakari. Kore dake desu ne. Arayuru koto. What's not just ego or keigaku or whatever you're studying. Arayuru koto. You have the ability at your age, just as I did when I was 13 and I started to teach myself Russian. You have the ability to make decisions for yourself. So this I call strong in the rain. Strong in the rain, strong in the wind, strong against the summer heat and snow. He is healthy and robust, free from desire. He never loses his temper, nor the quiet smile on his lips. He eats four go of unpolished rice, miso, and a few vegetables a day. He does not consider himself in whatever occurs. His understanding comes from observation and experience. And he never loses sight of things. He lives in a little thatched roof hut in a field in the shadows of a pine tree grove. If there is a sick child in the east, he goes there to nurse the child. If there's a tired mother in the west, he goes to her and carries her sheaves. If someone is near death in the south, he goes and says, don't be afraid. If there are strife and lawsuits in the north, he demands that the people put an end to their pettiness. He weeps at the time of drought he plods about at a loss during the cold summer. Everyone calls him blockhead. No one sings his praises or takes him to heart. That is the kind of person 
I want to do. And finally, I'd like to play for you a five-minute video of a song that was composed, uh, not yet played, uh, and start from the beginning, uh, composed, uh, commissioned by NHK after the disaster uh, in 2011, written by Iwai Shinji, uh, the lyrics, music by Kano Yoko, uh, it's called Hanawasaku, Flowers in Bloom, you probably know the song, but you've probably never seen it with English subtitle. So here it is, and I think what this song says is very much in tune with, if you'll excuse the pun, in tune with uh, Miyazawa Kenji and what I've been saying today. So, could we kyakuten o toshite kudasai? Hi. Arigatou gozaimashita. Utatteru shito wa minna tohoku shushin desu. Thank you.